Okay, welcome to lecture 1b, uh, where we look at the nature of chemical analysis. Um, think a little bit about qualitative and quantitative analysis and consider uh, the difference is associated with macronutrients and micronutrients. We'll look briefly at the gigantically wide range of chemical analysis techniques that are available and talk a little bit about some examples of student work. Okay, so nature of chemical analysis. It's all made up of chemicals. Uh, you do often hear people saying, well, this food contains chemicals. Well, of course it does. Proteins and carbohydrates and vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals are all chemicals. Uh, as usual, we point out it mostly contains water. Uh, but there's a wide range of different things we can analyze chemically in food. Okay, so there's a definition. Uh, in chemical analysis of food, we're often interested in what substances are present, such as sugars and fats. Often we need to understand how these substances affect the structure of foods. For example, what influence starches on the, have on the structure of a ready meal or a meal for dysphagia, for example. That is to say, people who have difficulty swallowing a key issue in dietetics. Uh, food's complicated. It's said to be heterogeneous. Uh, it's not possible to analyse every substance in food. Apart from practical issues, it would be very costly indeed. Um, it, it is difficult. If you, get, if you get two apples from the same tree, when one of them has been on the different side and got more sun, it'll give it a slightly different analysis to the other apple. Uh, so lots of things can influence the results we get from when we do food analysis. Okay, let's have a little think about what does this contain. Maybe pause the video for a second and think about the substance you will find in an orange. Uh, bear in mind what I've been saying in the past two segments of this video. The first most important one should be easy to guess, most important in terms of the amount that is. Um, Okay, I'm going to move the video on now, so if you haven't, pause now, or here we go. Yes, water. Uh, we can break carbohydrates down further. We can break down into different types of sugars. That's true of different other classes of molecules, of course. There are many different proteins com composed of 20 different amino acids. Uh, so there's lots of stuff we can do to break down what food com contains of. Okay, that's an important point. Okay, skip straight through that. In the blue, we have what's called, said to be a quantitative judgment. That is to say, a list of things which this particular food and orange contains, just the macronutrients in this case. Water, carbohydrates, proteins and fats. How much they contain is said to be quantitative. I think I said that the wrong way around, didn't I? The red is qualitative, what it contains. The blue is quantitative, how much it contains. And almost all food analysis is associated with quantitative analysis, usually of substances which we are looking for. Whether they know they are present, uh, perhaps analysing a food for the quality of amino acids, or we may be analysing a food to see if it's been contaminated with a particular heavy metal, for example. And there's an example of that uh, at a later uh, slide in this lecture. Okay, so again, another important point. Uh, the macronutrients uh, are said to be, because there's a lot of them, Micronutrients, the minerals, very small amounts, vitamins and provitamins and, and um, phytochemicals, even less. Uh, but we're capable of analysing all of these. We can analyse down to very small amounts these days. It's, it's astonishing we can, what we can do. In terms of metals, we can comfortably analyse down to parts per billion, uh, which is quite useful. OK, so here's a, a little data visualisation I did. Uh, just walk us through scale of nutrients in an orange. So I'll just open this up and hopefully it will work. Right, so it's linked from the slide so you can get it yourself. Okay, so in this case, the big orange area is macronutrients, 95.8%. And the two little ones down here are vitamins and minerals, very small amounts. Uh, if we move along the tabs, we see it's mostly water. Uh, we've taken out water there, and it's 86% water. Uh, down here we've got the carbohydrates, we've got the proteins, the fats, and then the vitamins, mostly vitamin C, and then the various minerals. Uh, we can take away the water, just leaving the micronutrients, and vitamin C massively predominates here, with the minerals being in quite big amounts, and they're almost buried, are things like carotenes and folates, uh, also available as a table and a pie chart. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a, a nice thing. I, I remember finding this in a magazine decades ago, what a, a, an orange contains. It's not even a complete list by any means. 
Uh, but we've got back to macro near range again. This one macro near range card again here. I'm going to take everything off. I'll put everything on and take everything off. And if we look at vitamin C, uh, bring up vitamin C. So that's a percentage. Unfortunately, the system gets a bit sort of complicated when it tries to round things off. If we look at carotene, molecule that's contained a vitamin vitamin A in the body. We'll see what tiny amount it is compared to vitamin C. Now, to an extent, this is because oranges have been selectively bred to produce high amounts of a taste we like, which just happens to be associated with vitamin C. The vitamin C is there for the oranges' own reasons. Look at some others. We'll have a good vitamin E. Uh, has vitamin E appeared? You can't even see vitamin E. So we'll have to take off vitamin C, probably. Do we see vitamin E? Assuming there is any. Yeah, there it is. Uh, it's uh, very much smaller than even the amount of carotenes. Uh, so... That visualization is there. You can have a play with it if you wish. Um, let me know what you think about it. Let me know if you think it could have been done any better. One of the ways we're interested in is how we visualize information. If you can come up with a better plan, that's great. Okay, chemical analysis techniques. This man map doesn't even scratch the surface. There are a huge number of different chemical analysis techniques, almost all of which can be used in food. A group of what we call classical analysis techniques up the top uh, tend to be not used that much these days. We tend to use things like HPLC and gas chromatography and ion coupled plasma mass spectrometry, a range of techniques which allow us to look predominantly at micronutrients. But we can also look at macronutrients as well, as we may remember we did in the lab last year. Uh, yeah, so okay, so broken down a little bit more into headings, classic analysis, so pH is often quite important, so the pH of coffee, for example, is a rough measure of the, of, of the, of the acid compounds it contains, and uh, perhaps an even better one would be yoghurt, you know, your yoghurt's alive if the pH is continuing to fall, because the bacteria must be still producing lactic acid. We spectroscopy, that's looking at colours. Now, colours could be not just a visible reason, but also infrared and UV. Uh, we do this in, 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 in complicated machines we have in the labs. But we're getting near the point where, as can be shown by the illustration at the centre of the top, where we can almost point and shoot using an app and a phone at food, and it'll give us a good idea what the food contains. We're not there yet, uh, but we're getting there. We'll certainly see that in the next few years, I think. We do a lot of chromatography often high-performance liquid chromatography, in this case, is looking at uh, caffeine. Caffeine, difference between regular coffee and decaffeinated coffee. Uh, we do physiochemical measures. Down the bottom left, we have a texture analyzer, which we use for a range of things, looking at how texture changes for a field, food that might have been made in a hospital. It might have been designed for a, a person who has specific requirements for how soft the food has to be. But then what happens is it's made in the cusp, it's regenerated typically in the hospital kitchen in a microwave, and then it might be quite a while before it reaches the person who's going to eat it, during which time its properties may have changed. And then there's this wide range of what we call hyphenated techniques. So there's one there is gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy, looking at pesticides in food, wide variety of these things, many with specific applications in food. Uh, okay, so here's some student work. Uh, the graphs in the top left, uh, are looking at what I've just talked about in the previous slide, foods for people who have difficulty in swallowing, and looking at the effect of time. And you see the lines going up, the blue and the yellow line going up, indicating that the food is becoming harder to swallow over time, which may have serious implications for the patient. Uh, the one with the orange is something which we did in first year. I think we did we did beta carotene in oranges. Uh, no, tell that we did vitamin C in oranges. We'll do beta carotene this year, and there's a calibration line. Um, and off to the bottom left, we have, again, a topic we'll cover in this module, polyphenol oxidase, the enzyme that makes apples go brown when you expose them to air, uh, and looking at the various substances that can inhi inhibit that process. Um, so quite an important economic area, as, as well as being an area of scientific interest. And many, many, many more methods. You read any analytical chemistry technique, uh, textbook, you'll find lots and lots of information. Lots and lots, lots and lots. Are we finished yet? Yeah, we are finished. Yeah, so again, qualitative and quantitative analysis, what and how much, just reiterating what I've already said. We're mostly interested in quantitative analysis. And here's just some examples. Is it a qualitative test? Does it contain, is it acid or is it basic? 
Let's have a think for a moment about what this doesn't tell us. Uh, you might want to pause the video. In a moment, it's saying that this, in this case, the uh, material picture there is blue, so it is a alkali or a base. If it had gone red, it would, would have said it was an acid. But what's that not telling us? Let's assume it's an acid and it's gone red. What, what isn't that telling us? So pause the video and have a think about that. All right, so okay, I'm going to come back and some of the things which we probably need to know, but which this test isn't telling us how much. We can pass on the pH. Uh, the lower the pH, the more acidity is present. It's not going to tell us which acids, though. You probably have to do an analytical technique, something like HPLC. Again, that would be the only way you could find out how much H acid is present. Now, this is obviously of interest for a number of reasons. One is the taste profiles of food. Um, people would daily love to produce a grapefruit, which doesn't taste bitter. Uh, there are actually ways of making it not taste bitter, but we may come back to them in later lectures. Yeah, so we can use a pH meter. We can titrate. We probably tend to use a pH meter these days. More convenient. Uh, people have less experience of doing titrations. Yeah, so which fruit acids? There's just some, some of the typical fruit acids we find. Citric acid you're probably familiar with. Uh, oxalic acid you've probably heard of. And many, many others. Many, many others which we can potentially analyse for. And people look at the impact of these on things like taste and also how the food changes over time. Lots and lots of research interest in this area. Yeah, so quantitative analysis. We usually know what, as I've said, the question is how much. And this, for example, is looking at uh, various examples of the taste components in tea. So these catechins are the things that give tea its taste. And this is an example um, done by HPLC, looking at the various components of a particular tea. Okay, so that's all for this one. Hope it was useful. Be back in a moment for part C, part three.